Hello, Dr. Matthews again. This chapter five is an overview of viruses. Now, there's a tremendous amount in your textbook. I tried to narrow this lecture down somewhat so it's not quite as extensive. One thing that I would do if I were listening to this is I would listen and take a highlighter and highlight my book, but that's just up to you. The general structure of viruses, they're microscopic particles that infect cells. They're basically made up of a genome of DNA or RNA wrapped in a capsule of, of a sort, depending on the type of virus. They cannot reproduce by themselves. They are acellular, no cells. They are obligate intracellular parasites means they have to have a cell and they affect both eukaryotes, that's animals, plants, and we all know they infect us, and prokaryotes such as, well, bacteria and archaea. Now a bacteriophage, and they're pretty cool looking, we've got a picture coming up, is a virus that infects bacteria. And if you hear someone refer to a phage, it's they're talking about a bacteriophage. It's just a shortened version, sort of a nickname for bacteriophage. Bacteria are classified and they're still working desperately on this and they change it all the time. Uh, it's difficult to figure out what's related to what, but morphology, what do they look like? the nucleic acid type, which is going to be DNA and RNA, how they replicate uh, the host. They're named often by the host they infect and very much the disease they cause. We call uh, in, in, an influenza virus, you know, would be caused influenza. Okay, they come in order and they come in family, subfamily, genus, and species. And then way beyond this species, you're going to have different serovars or types. And here's a different classification that we're not going to go into. Morphology, they're, that's shape. They're very, very small. Uh, parvovirus is tiny, 20 nanometers. And a pox virus can be up to 450 nanometers. But you can't visualize anything but possibly this Mimi virus that's very unusual, a uh, diameter of 750 nanometers that's been found in free living amoebas, is, uh, has been found and seen under a microscope. And it's the largest viral virus known, about a thousand genes, and it's a DNA virus. Size comparison, this is an E. coli bacteria. This is an Ebola virus, see how big it is? Bacteriophage, poliovirus, and it's a different bacteriophage. They, virus consists of the genetic material, that's your DNA or RNA, and it's carried in a coat or a capsid. The capsid is made up of proteins, and of course they're coded for by the viral genes, and then the host cell has to make them. The capsid is very complex, and it is what you look at and look at the shape of under an electron microscope to tell what it is. And you have protomeres that form capsomeres, and they come together to form a capsid. The pictures are so much better than words. Okay, this is a nucleic acid, just a little blob. It's not organized like you would expect in a human. This is the capsomere this whole thing is a capsid, and then this is your outer wrapper. See, it's got spikes on it. These spikes 
attached to the host so that they can invade cells. Proteins that are associated with nucleic acids are called nucleoproteins, and the association of the viral capsid proteins with a nucleic acid is a nucleocapsid. And spikes are the long projections from the nucleocapsid. And the virion is a fully assembled virus. Now, when we make vaccines or when we test for viruses, we may simply check for one part of it. If they're looking for vaccine, uh, whether your COVID vaccine worked, they're going to look for spike proteins to the COVID vaccine. But if they're looking for infection, they're going to look for, they call them the N, the N protein. So I so assume they're looking for this, nucleic acids, the, the protein associated with it. Okay, morphology, Helico, helical viruses. They have rod-shaped capsomeres, and it can be a single strand of RNA or a single strand of DNA. It can be a, a naked, running around without clothes on. And the tobacco mosaic virus is one example. Or they can be enveloped, which is influenza virus. And we're going to talk about enveloped viruses in just a few minutes. This is a helical virus. See, it's wrapped around, 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 around. This nucleic acid is going around in this helical shape. You have your capsid and your individual little capsomeres here. So you can see why they call it helical. Isocahedral viruses, uh, multidimensional, we'll look at a picture in a minute. Examples, herpes viruses, adenoviruses, papoviridae, parvoviridae. And there's an example right here. You look at all these different sides to it. That's kind of a cool looking, looks like you'd want to hang it on a tree or something. Okay, enveloped virus. This is as opposed to a naked virus. Now a naked virus is one that doesn't have an envelope. Now what the envelope is, it's the, the, the envelope surrounds the rest of the virus, the nucleocapsid. And it happens by the host, it, it buds through the host membrane, taking some of the membrane with it, usually the plasma membrane. Now I show here a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now you can think about if that virus, that enveloped virus gets into your body and has your plasma membrane on it, your immune system might not notice it real quickly. So this is a trickier virus to, for your immune system to deal with. And here's one that's enveloped. This is your outer envelope here. Complex viruses, these are pretty cool, but bacteriophages or phages, they have a head and then a tail and attached fibers. Look at that picture. That is the coolest looking thing. I love the way that a phage looks. Very complex capsid here, the DNA. And then it's got these little feet. It looks just like a little spaceship or maybe a spider. And these little legs attached here. And it's like a syringe. It, these attach. And this is your injection, your needle, and it just shoots that nucleic acid into the bacteria. And that's just the coolest looking thing you ever saw. I think it's pretty cool, just so you're not a bacteria. Complex viruses, pox viruses, lack your regular capsid, and they're surrounded by, have a nucleoid surrounded by a membrane and two this is the overall structure of your pox virus. You have your nucleic acid, you have your lateral bodies, your core membrane, and then your outer capsule here. The genome type can be either DNA 
or RNA. And the nucleic acid will be linear or it may be in a closed loop. Depends on you know, what it is. Um, exception to these uh, cytomegalovirus. And then we have reverse transcribing viruses. Have an RNA genome but replicate via DNA intermediate. And this is what AIDS does, HIV does. It's an RNA virus and then it replicates. It makes a DNA and then it makes your body forces it to make a DNA and then it puts out the RNA virus. Now, viruses are acellular. I think I'll try this marker and see if this isn't better. They're acellular, no cells. And because they're acellular, they don't replicate through cell division. Well, that didn't work. There we go. They have to have a host. Yeah, that works. And the host machinery is hijacked by the virus and it makes copies of the virus. Outside of the host cell viruses are in outside of the host cell viruses are inert particles. They're nothing. They're not alive. When you catch a virus, you don't think about them not being alive. I look at them like uh, you know the zombies or the vampires or something, the undead. They're not living, but they sure act like it. Okay, multiplication of animal viruses, and this is very similar to the phage virus multiplication, and I decided there was no reason to go through both. Adsorption, penetration, uncoating, replication, assembly, and release. And we'll look at the these individually. It just depends on the virus on how long this takes. Adsorption. This means it's attaching to the susceptible host. Now, when you've got a cold, your nose is going to run and you're going to have a real snotty nose. The purpose of that snot is not just to aggravate you. It's making your nose nice and slimy where more virus particles can't attach. And though, then when you sneeze it out, that's the particles that are there are going to sneeze on your neighbor. If you're not wearing a mask, which you all are right now, in fact, you should be wearing a mask just watching a video about viruses. I think it's a good idea. Not really, but I should think it is. Okay, viruses are specific to their host cells. They generally only have one host. Some have several species. For instance, chimpanzees can carry HIV. In fact, HIV probably came from chimpanzees. And where it probably came from is people getting hungry and they needed meat and a chimpanzee was all like a catch. And then when they clean the meat, they cut themselves and they get the animal blood, uncooked animal blood into their own body and they've just been infected with HIV. That's probably where it started. There's no way we have absolutely proven that, but that's a pretty typical guess. Now, the attachment of the virus has to attach to specific receptors. Now, how weird is it that a virus is adapted to know a receptor in your body to attach to? Now, HIV virus attaches only to CD4 cell receptors, which are immune system receptors. Some humans do not have CD4 cell receptors for HIV, and so they can't get AIDS. They cannot get HIV. So animals that lack receptors are not going to get that. They're completely resistant. Now, the receptor for COVID is thought to be the ACE2 receptor. Um, ACE2 inhibitor, uh, ACE2 receptor blocker, I should say. Uh, there are several of them, but Losartan, it is a uh, blood pressure medication. In fact, I take it myself. And it begs one to wonder, does
taking Losartan decrease your chance of getting COVID? Uh, maybe. Did I still get my vaccine? Yes, because that's all theorizing. The vaccine is known to stop the spread of the virus. Penetration. Okay, it's already attached. Now it's got to penetrate the host. So it goes into the cell and it may be endocytosis. Now how weird. The cell actually just takes it in, opens the door, eats it. Not a good plan. Or it may fuse with the viral envelope and the plasma membrane of the host. Or maybe only the nucleocapsid enters the cell. Like that cool phage I showed you where it actually injects the nuclear material into the cell. Then it's got to be uncoded. It's got to get undressed to get busy here. The viral nucleic acid is released because if it's not, you're not getting anything done. And it's going to, okay, the virus entered the cell one way or another. It's going to be enclosed if it's by endocytosis. It's going to be enclosed in a vacuolar vesicle, and they're going to have enzymes in it that are going to dissolve that capsid, probably in an attempt to get rid of that virus, and instead they're going to release the viral nucleic acid into that cell. Replication. Now, immediately after they're uncoded, a DNA virus is going to uh, enter the nucleus of the host and it's going to be transcribed by that host into messenger RNA. Then it's going to leave the cytoplasm. The messenger RNA is then going to be translated into early viral proteins, which then further aid and then you get full replication of the viral DNA. So they hijack the host and make it produce new viruses. Okay, RNA viruses have to have their own transcription polymerase. They, they don't get as much help from the cell. Retroviruses uh, do a little different route. This thing's bouncing everywhere. In all three cases, translation of the viral messenger RNA occurs in the host ribosomes. And the host ribosomes are going to produce the viral proteins that are then going to allow for the final assembly of the virus. So now you've got a whole bunch of viruses in this cell. Then what are you going to do with it? Uh, several things. Budding, exocytosis. Spit them out, keep making them. And that's probably the best thing for the virus to make more and more cells, I mean more and more virus particles, I shouldn't say cells, or not cells, or lysis of the cell. The cell breaks completely down and dies, and when it does so, uh, the virus particles are released, and then they go on to infect other cells. So you started off with one virus, you made 2,000, it lysed, and now you have 2,000 cells infected. Doesn't take long to get in bad shape, but your immune system, we'll talk about later. Okay, multiplication of naked animal viruses, absor adsorption, penetration, and then it's gonna uncoat. It goes in, these are DNA viruses, into the cell, messenger RNA is formed, causes viral DNA to be made. Uh, within the ribosomes, and then you're going to get the mature maturation and assembly of the virus, and it's going to be released. And then if they're, if they're enveloped, and as you remember, the enveloped might be a little bit better at evading your defense mechanisms. Adsorption, penetration, it gets into the cell, then it's uncoated, viral replication, production of capsid proteins, you make a whole new virus, they're released. Same basic process. Okay, viral infections. We have several types. Abortive. You get infected, you get the virus, they get into your cells, but they don't do anything. 
you don't get new viruses produced it's just nothing and then you can have a lytic phase uh, or cytocidal it kills the host cell and then you may have persistent infection they just sit in the cell and hang out and damage yourself persistent can be different ways it can be chronic they're not lytic but they're producing new virus so eventually they're going to come back to haunt you latent you have limited synthesis or no viral synthesis synthesis so they may be the virus may be in an asymptomatic in the host for years best examples chicken pox and shingles you get chicken pox when you're five or six years old you haven't had a single sign of it you get to be 72 you're stressed because you're 72 and you just notice that you're old or you had family problems or maybe a sore foot something some sort of stress your immune system is weakened and then the latent virus has been sitting in those nerves and it sits in the nerves in the skin that go around the chest and up the neck and shingles will break out and go around the body and you know from the back towards the front and the old folks all say if it meets in the middle you die but that's not true it can meet in the middle and you don't die just in case anyone ever asks you now there are slow infections you get a virus it hangs out for years and years and years and then it's followed by a disease that's for years they talked about MS being a slow virus never identified any virus uh, that caused MS though, multiple sclerosis transforming infections the viral nucleic acid hangs out without causing virus production but it can cause cancer on congenic changes and for sure we know that viruses do cause some types of things like feline leukemia virus bovine leukemia virus haven't identified I don't know if there's been a human leukemia virus identified I wouldn't be surprised if it's there now in the cats it takes direct contact and it's species specific you cannot catch leukemia from your cat okay host cell damage um, there may be morphological changes and so cytopathic they change the shape uh, cause tissue surface lysis the membranes fuse may become more permeable and eventually you get cell death and then physiological changes you get addition of, vir of viral proteins into the plasma membrane you get changes in ion movement other activity and it just messes up the cellular activities okay biochemical effects uh, inhibition of the host macromolecules genotoxic effects they may damage the cell DNA or cause mutations in cells may actually cause cancer now major groups of viruses in vertebrates they cause disease after they break protective various barriers and most viruses are specific to a particular cell tissue type like a respiratory virus only likes respiratory tissue uh, some viruses may uh, like more than one but a particular virus causes a specific disease but some diseases may be caused by several viruses like encephalitis there are many viruses and bacterium that can cause encephalitis now the genome of viruses of course we've mentioned is DNA or RNA DNA virus and we're just going to go through a few examples adenoviruses and uh, there have been 50 different serotypes identified in humans they're generally very stable and they actually use them 
parts of them to uh, make some types of vaccines, gene therapy, and that the ones that cause diseases mostly cause respiratory illnesses, may cause gastroenteritis, conjunctivitis, cystitis, or rashes, but most don't really do much of anything. Okay, another type of DNA viruses is padenoviruses. Hepatitis. Hepatitis B is a good example. And it causes uh, liver failure. It can cause acute disease, chronic disease, and some people may have asymptomatic disease. If you're in the healthcare field, you really need to be vaccinated. In fact, it's probably mandatory because it is a blood-borne disease. And if you get a needle stick, you're probably a lot more apt to get hepatitis, likely to get hepatitis B than you are to get AIDS. You really need to be vaccinated. Okay, herpes viruses. Herpes simplex 1 and 2. Herpes simplex 1 prefers the north side of the proverbial belt barrier. Herpes simplex 2 prefers the south side. They can swap sides given the opportunity. Now, varicella zoster virus causes chickenpox. Papillomaviruses cause warts and cervical cancers. And cancers of things that come in contact with such cervical, cervical cancers and cervical warts. The papillomavirus vaccines for I think they're for age 27 and under. I think it's a very good idea to get these vaccines for your kids or for yourself because you just never know where life's going to lead you and it could prevent you from getting cancer. It's been said at some point before the vaccine that most people have ended up getting it because somebody or another in a partnership has probably been exposed somewhere very, very contagious, so it doesn't cause cancer in most people, but there's been a lot of people who get cervical cancer, and it's, that could be totally prevented. Okay, parvovirus. There's only one parvovirus in a human, which is the B19. In dogs, there's one parvovirus, and it's called canine parvovirus. And if you don't vaccinate your dog for this, you're going to regret it very deeply. It causes vomiting and bloody diarrhea and death of your dog. It's interesting that many years ago, early 70s, there was really not much anything to do. There was no parvovirus. And this was a pandemic that I don't have the exact year. I meant to look that up. Uh, there was a pandemic that just went around the world all at once. It's never gone away and dogs still get it. Um, some people theorize that it, there was a contamination in some very popular dog food, but that doesn't explain how it gets to third world countries where the dogs get fed scraps, or for that matter, rural areas. Also, if it infects any canids, uh, coyotes, wolves, they can get it for sure. Pox viruses. Uh, this is a smallpox is the best example here largest virus particles there are. And we looked at that picture of the arm with the smallpox and then the cowpox. You remember that picture if you watched the slideshow several back. Okay, RNA viruses. We have Bunyaviridae. These are arthropod pod born, born viruses and we will go through some of those later. Coronavirus. <laughs> I think we're real familiar with coronaviruses. Respiratory and enteric disease. SARS was the first big one that came out. But COVID-19, they developed beautiful vaccines for it. Uh, and then we started getting variants off this, mutations. Now we got the Delta variant. I was told by a reliable source that Macon Hospital is almost completely, the Macon hospitals are almost completely full of people with the Delta variant of uh, coronavirus. For sure and for certain, there's not a single bed at Vanderbilt University 
in Nashville, Tennessee, Vanderbilt, because uh, of the Delta variant. Now, in Vanderbilt, not a single person who is in the hospital had a vaccine. So that's something to take into effect. Now, I do know a person who had the vaccine, was you know, completely vaccinated, and he did get sick and he tested positive for coronavirus, but he did not get terribly sick. He didn't lose his sense of smell, taste. He got over it, and he's fine. Without those vaccines, he may well have died. So, you know, you make your own choice, but it's very deadly. Hepatitis virus um, causes, well, we have several, A, B, C, and D. Hepatitis, hepatitis cirrhosis, cancers. Uh, orthomyxoviridae or viruses. Influenza, A, B, and C. And A is the most common type in humans. And flu kills a lot of people. And that's another thing that I personally get vaccinated for every year because before I did, I got sick, got bronchitis and even pneumonia every single year. And since I started getting vaccinated, I generally stay a lot healthier. Now, paramyxoviruses, um, these are some of the ones that I'm not real familiar with. Paramyxovirus, it's highly pathogenic. Hendra virus, I've heard of these. But these are not ones that I'm terribly familiar with. But coronaviruses, um, these are the smallest RNA viruses known. Rhabdoviruses or rhabdoviridae, one of my very favorite groups of viruses because it has rabies in it. And these only infect mammals and only mammals who have a body temperature within the range of 97 Fahrenheit to maybe 103 Fahrenheit. They don't infect birds because their temperature is too high. They don't infect armadillos because their temperature is too low. Or there, And there's never been an infection of rabies reported in an opossum. Rats, mice get it, but they die before they spread it to humans. And we'll talk about rabies more. Rabies is fun. Rotavirus uh, causes gastroenteritis. 50% of all cases of diarrhea in children requiring hospitalization is from a rotavirus. Oh, that's a lot. Retroviruses, uh, HIV is an example, and we'll go through that in more detail later. Togaviruses. An example is rubella. Rubella, um, there is a vaccine, so it's not very common now, but if one is pregnant and gets rubella, it causes damage to the fetus, brain damage, um, visual damage, possibly death, miscarriage. Okay, flaviviruses, these are some pretty serious things. West Nile virus, you've all heard of that one, I know. Hepatitis C is actually a flavivirus. Yellow fever, some types of encephalitis. Dengue fever, this is spread by mosquitoes and it's called breakbone fever to people in the area where it's common. And it's common not terribly far south of us. I mean, south of Miami, but it's still, it, it could make it to Miami, spread by mosquitoes. But the reason they call it break bone fever is because you hurt so bad you think you broke your bones. And it can be fatal. Okay, now subviral agents. Viroids, uh, they cause plant diseases and they work alone. They don't have to have a virus involved. Virusoids have to have a helper virus. And generally it's plant infections. But an example is hepatitis delta virus or hepatitis D. The person has to already have hepatitis B to get hepatitis D. Another reason to take the hepatitis vaccine, hepatitis B vaccine. Prions, and we will talk about these more later. They're very interesting. They're not living organisms. 
proteinaceous infectious particles. Starts off, you have a normal protein in animal tissue, and we're talking about nervous tissue, and they fold a certain way. Say they're supposed to fold this way. Well, then for some reason, there's a mutation and they fold that way. And when they're abnormally folded, it, they become infectious and they start making copies of themselves. So instead of having copies of this and this and this, you end up with a lot of this and this and this. And it's on brain cells. And I'm trying to copy that. And it causes leaks. There's no nucleic acid. It's just protein. And it causes the transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. The most familiar with, the most familiar one is mad cow disease. Kuru is another one mentioned. We'll talk about it for sure. And these, um, the interesting thing about prions is you can burn them. It doesn't destroy them. You can cook them. You can microwave them. You can autoclave them and they still seem to cause disease. Uh, it all started as far as this mad cow disease when they fed goat scraps to cows as a protein source. Uh, cows are supposed to be herbivores and they started making them be carnivores and it didn't work out well and it, it was a, considered a major epidemic even though there were just several hundred people died of it but when you have a 16 year old that gets symptoms of severe dementia and dies within six months that's impressive and so the UK destroyed their cattle herd because of this and then after a time they brought in new cattle and I don't know if they still have the rules in effect but they were only allowing the people you have a cow she can have one calf, then you got to get rid of her, and then you get another cow or keep the babies because it takes three years for it to grow in a cow, so you don't want a cow to be three years old. Okay, that's the end of this. We'll talk about other things later.